insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You're listening to a new Redefining Cybersecurity Podcast with Sean Martin. Have you ever thought that we're selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Well, perhaps we are. Let's look at how we can organize a successful information security program that integrates business culture with people, process, and technology to drive growth and protect business value. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at devo.com. Everybody, this is Sean Martin, the host of Redefining Cybersecurity Podcast. You're all very welcome to a new episode today, where I typically get to talk about all things uh, operationalizing security, and often focuses on programs and people and processes and how all that fits into an org to to make them uh, operate more securely, to protect the revenue they generate, and hopefully even help generate some revenue in a safe way. Um, it, it's easy to forget that there are people behind all this stuff and uh, they, they, they make it all work and we need to support those folks in a, in a good way. And there are a number of initiatives uh, around that, uh, that try to help with this. And I came across one the other day that uh, common good security is the name of it. And I was like, I want to learn more about this. There's a lot of logos attached to it some names that I'm familiar with as well, folks that I've spoken with in the past. Um, I want to learn more and hopefully my audience does as well. So I'm thrilled to have Phil and Josh on the show today. Thanks guys for, for being here. Glad to be here, Sean. Thank you. It's good good to meet you and see you uh, as well. And you have a big event coming up in a couple of days. I get I get some fun to uh, to produce this on, uh, on rapid pace after we're done, <laughs> done recording, which I'm thrilled to do and happy to do. Uh, there's a workshop in, in uh, D.C. February 26 and 27. So folks who can make that, of course, will make a call to action at the end as well. But it makes no sense unless you know what it is. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So uh, before we get into those nuts and bolts, uh, a few words from each of you about who you are, what you're up to, and, and why you are part of what we're talking about today. And Phil, uh, I'll lead off with you. Sure, Sean. Thank you. Uh, my name's Phil Reidinger. Um, I'm the president and CEO of the Global Cyber Alliance, which is a global nonprofit that works on cybersecurity implementation. Why I'm involved in this is I've, I've been doing cybersecurity for over 30 years now, roughly. Uh, and you know a lot of the problems have stayed the same. And part of the challenge is that you know in other infrastructures, right, like in the highways, governments are essentially responsible for going around and fixing potholes. Um, in the power lines, it's public utilities or commercial utilities. And everybody's got a funding model and a set of roles and responsibilities that go with it, so we get the services we need. That's not how the internet works. Um, the internet works to a very large degree. You know, companies do some things, government do some things, but the number of volunteers or nonprofits out there who go around and fix potholes or you know build highways or keep the internet running by analogy is really quite shocking and the level of support for those people is you know it is at best at best razor thin 
Um, and so we need to do something to solve that. And I'm not suggesting we move away from the multi-stakeholder model. The internet's given us a lot because of that. But we've got to find ways to support the people who are doing the work. So we, the, the answer to the question is, will the internet be there tomorrow? Or can I surf the web? Is not probably. <laughs> <laughs> nice one nice one good intro and and josh i am the calvary huge fan of uh what you do there one of many things you're involved with what's going on um when i saw that this uh initiative was being launched to kind of look across myriad nonprofits, all doing different pieces of the of the big bigger picture i kind of felt like i had to uh get involved myself um so I was happy to see this happening. And I bring a pretty different perspective. Um, I and the Cavalry never took any funding. So we turned a decade old on August 1st. We've done a lot of this just through sheer grit and stubbornness and trying to do the right thing the right way and build trust, meet people where they are, identify by down risk. Sometimes we've bobbed in and out of other nonprofits, like I did a stint at the Atlantic Council running the Cyber Statecraft Initiative for a couple of years or a congressional task force. And then during the pandemic, I went into CISA to design and implement the CISA COVID task force. But I think we've gotten our hands dirty and we've tried to be the ones that try to bring some urgency and um, pragmatism and find something that sucks and make it suck less. And we've got a pretty good track record. At the same time, when I saw this uh, initiative start, I said, we've got some good things going on, but the world's getting worse faster. And um, we have to find some way to talk amongst ourselves and pick the right targets and make sure that there we don't have maybe funding or maybe support or maybe alignment but conscious deliberate um, common cause common purpose and common impact so i'm um cautiously optimistic to to meet with all these other groups um and really find a more sustainable model too because we don't want something the, the, the cavalry didn't want to find problems and own them we wanted to find things that fell between the cracks of the public private partnership where the par private sector you know public sector can't do it but the private sector won't do it. We want to catch those drop balls, make sure not, we reduce harm, but eventually we want to get those integrated into the system so they're owned and funded properly going forward. But too much of this uh, internet and critical infrastructure depends on volunteers with bubble gum, bailing wire, duct tape, a little Statue of Mary, maybe a prayer. Uh, and, and that's not gonna, gonna cut it going forward. So okay. I, can see the, I can see the candle burning, Josh. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And also we're aging out too. Some, some people, you know, we're losing some of our best um, altruistic, you know, pillars of industry to either age, retirement, to death. Um, and uh, we, we need a more comprehensive, aligned and strategic, sustainable plan. So I'm really eager to see what we come up with, at least for the beginning of an initiative. Did I answer your question? It does. <laughs> it does. Uh, eloquently, uh, as always, Josh. And, um, and meaningful too. It's not just uh, not just smoke. This is important stuff. And and Phil, I I want to I want to get your view on what. So you gave a nice analogy of, of the the I'll call it the road infrastructure, if you will. Um, can you maybe shed a little more light on some of the real things that that you see happening, you see coming, uh, that this this initiative is really aimed at tackling. Sure, Sean. So, um, you know, this all started about a year and a half ago when we had a meeting uh, in Europe that included a bunch of nonprofits, and it was super interesting because all of the nonprofits around the table, and this is a bunch of entities that do mission critical stuff for the internet, things that ordinary people would, although they don't know it, miss if it were not there. Um, and their story was essentially this. Cybersecurity funding for us to do what we do is, you know, is almost non-existent. And if it's there, it's to build the new thing, not to make sure that the old thing that everybody depends on continues to work. Uh, and so we started a group getting together, and we had a we had a planning meeting for what we might do about this at the Canadian Embassy. Um, in D.C. last year. We had about 30 people involved, about um, 15 remote, about 15 in person, four from governments, people from industry and nonprofits. And everybody wanted to do something more sustainable. 
you know, Josh talked before in his comments about, you know, we've really got to get serious about this, right? You, you see people stand up and say, hey, you know, I do critical stuff and I don't have funding. Um, or a group of nonprofits will say, hey, we need funding. But nothing gets done about it. So um, Common Good Cyber is an effort to try and address that, to actually move from plans to action, which is always the hardest step. So uh, we're kicking off the work. It's, it's actually intended not to just be uh, an event or a conference, but a workshop to kick off an initiative um, to move us from ideas to action. So, you know, it's three half days, essentially. The first half day is on getting everybody on the same page. The second half day is on brainstorming solutions. And then the, the third half day, the morning of the 27th, is about what do we actually do? What are the action plans? How do we move forward? So that, you know, by a year from now, let's say we want a Cyber United Way. That we've actually got it working Cyber United Way. Maybe we need a joint fund. Uh, maybe we need joint fundraising. Um, those are the sorts of ideas we want to move forward on. And we've got a really good collection of people to kick off the work uh, early if, next week. If I may, Phil, because what, if I'm understanding this correctly, is it, we're saying there will always be, kind of to Josh's point, places in the gaps that one one side, however many sides there are, will never pick up and own. And so there, we need to we need to find a way, presumably through this initiative, to identify and and fill those holes. I think we're like we have identifying and filling the holes. This initiative is about making sure we have the funding models for people who who are doing that identification and filling those holes. And yes, to specifically answer your question, those holes will always exist because the internet is unique. Um, it is run by a multiple set of stakeholders, and it is global, right? Almost everything else rolls up somewhere, whether it's a government or you know a particular set of private sector players that do everything. The internet is never going to be that way. Um, you know, it's not even as much as the U.S. or the U.K. or Germany or France or Singapore contribute to the internet. It's never going to be just their responsibility. There's always going to be cracks. There's always going to be you know a couple of people writing a piece of open source software that's going to become critical and used by everybody. And it's not going to get funded. The upkeep's not going to happen unless we've got a mechanism to, to identify how do we fund those people and how we help them. There's um... – and, and the world is changing too, right? So when some of these excellent initiatives were started, even if they were funded, um, you know, we we should be paying attention to evolutions in how dependent societies are on this connected technology, what the adversaries are doing, how aggressively they're doing it, and the funding cycles and the 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 caloric effort to make to stand up an effort to staff an effort to to keep fundraising for that effort to keep executing for that effort it's it's non-trivial so how do we make sure that there's a strategic plan across these different funders and funding sources and projects that pay attention to which things are rising which are falling which are evergreen you know more more conscious deliberate and planful um than maybe just scattershot with anything in cybersecurity, you go to RSA conference or, or Black Hat or DEF CON, there's always the new hotness. So it's easier to get conversations about the new hotness. It doesn't necessarily mean those are the most important things or the most um, or the ones that we can draw attention away from. So for me, like, for example, I think a lot of the public private partnerships um, tend to be focused by accident or maybe on purpose for the haves, not the have nots. So when I was during the, doing the CISA COVID task force, we saw 85% of the owners and operators of hospitals or water and wastewater or electrical municipal grids or food supply, they're target rich, but cyber poor. And that's an area where Phil's organization has cared about the cyber poor a lot more than say public private partnerships have. You know, the poor don't have the lobbyists, they don't spend time in DC, they don't end up on the news. And when we talk about best practices or 
voluntary things. These are things that are the privilege of very wealthy, well-funded, larger critical infrastructure operators. But zoom out, you know, believe your own eyes. We've had success, successful cyber disruption of the water we drink, the food supply we put on our table, oil and gas pipelines that fuel our cars, homes, and supply chains, municipalities, the schools your kids go to, timely access to patient care with mortal consequences. Stuff's on fire. And this can't all be volunteer fire brigades, right? So we're doing some good things in the government. The White House is taking more attention. CIS is getting more involved. But for the foreseeable future, they're very dependent on civil society and volunteers. And it's got to scale, especially as the, the frequency, duration, and impact of the disruptions continue. So I, I hope we can not just organically grow these efforts and scattershot them, but make sure we really know what's too important to fail, who's on task, where the gaps are, and how to ensure that um, we, uh, we have a sustainable model of catching these errors, finding the proper homes for them, and knowing when something doesn't belong in either the public or the private sector. And is that the, so the, it's not just you, I know there's a couple other organizers we were hoping to bring on for this conversation, but then there's also a number of other entities involved, like I Am The Calvary is one of them, there's a handful of logos or so on the page is the idea that that this consortium of entities leads the way and finds more volunteers brings more entities in kind of describe what you see happening over the next year or two with this well the the goal is implementation right so you know this is a workshop as i said before to go from thought to action right so we want to come out of Tuesday with an idea of some particular models that may make sense. And then, you know, it's the, it's the, it is all of the partners in the initiative working to move forward on implementation of those models. And some people will have different or bigger roles um, than others, right? It's it, in that sense, it is a coalition of the willing. You know, my organization, the Global Cyber Alliance, is sort of, you know, serving as the the hub to organize these kinds of things. But there's a secretariat, if you will, of a lot of organizations, including you know, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams, the Cyber Peace Institute, um, the Shadow Server Foundation. Um, there's a lot of folks, um, Chris Painter from the GFCE, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise is involved. There's a lot of people that are um, involved in the effort. And, you know, our plan is to, is to see what the art of the possible is. It is the start to an initiative. There's going to be um, a, we'll do, continue to do outreach events. So there'll be a panel at RSA. So you won't just hear AI at RSA, right? You're, most every panel and things you're going to hear at RSA will be about AI, the way it used to be about blockchain, right? That's the, that's the point that, that Josh was making. But we're going to sit there and talk about common good cyber at RSA. We're expecting another follow-up workshop to sort of keep people involved and in the loop, um, probably in Europe in around October. Um, and you know, the goal is to move forward. And I think we'll have... You know, we'll have players that are super interested. The The keynote on Monday is being given by Kimba Walden, who you probably know. I know Josh does, is the former acting national cyber director and has now started a new sort of a kind of a, a, a think tanky, but very implementation focused cybersecurity entity at Paladin Capital, right? So you know, more and more organizations, right? That's venture capital starting to say, hey, we got to solve this problem. Right. We just need we need the or the people to put the the mind share and the dedicated work into moving forward. So it's not ad hoc. You know, I think that's what Josh was saying in so much of his comments. It's it's we've got to get away from some of the ad hocery and hmm. get to some strategy and some systemic approaches that are sustainable without losing the value that the multi-stakeholder model and approach on the internet have given us. You know, nobody wants the government or one company to tell them how to behave um, on the internet for the most part. So we've got to we've got to find the right way to move forward in that regard. Yeah, and uh, it is a play in three acts with some intermissions and whatnot. I'm most keenly focused on the prep for 
the one I'm involved in, the first of the three, although everyone's going to be in the chorus for all of it. Um, so I'll maybe illustrate what the very first block is, and then maybe Phil can add about the other two. But in the first block, we're kind of illustrating the problem or the efforts thus far, like what were the potholes or missing pieces in the internet or critical infrastructure or civil society that some of us tried to fill. Um, pardon the pun, Phil Reitinger. But um, <laughs> the uh, so I'm gonna I'm the, the weirdest one I think. But there's the shadow server group that's really helped make sure the internet continued to work for all this time with a bunch of graybeards um, doing thankless work. We're going to have someone from the MITRE ATT&CK framework R&D that was, you know, done because something needed to be done, not because it had a funded project and everyone's benefiting from ATT&CK framework. Uh, but, it, you know, to make it grow and last um, can't be done forever uh, unfunded. And um, and then with the I and the Cavalry were a bit anomalous in that we've done this for 10 years. I didn't think it was going to be a 10 year initiative. I was hoping it didn't need to be a 10 year initiative. And it's really tough for people to have a, almost a full time day job on top of their day job to do this forever. So perhaps we would have benefited uh, from paid staff or organizational operational back end. Um, and as the world gets more dangerous, um, we shouldn't just always rely on the backs of 100 percent volunteers all the time. So as we look at our future, what's that going to be? So this is kind of reminding people of things they might not even have known about how much of their safety and continuity of service has depended on the backs of idiot altruists trying to uh, play catcher in the eye and find and fix problems. So we are not representative of everybody that's kept things going, but I'm hoping Kemba brings some fire and some urgency, uh, and I hope we can show the things that have been done but we're going to be followed by breakout rooms and then two other topics. So Phil, you want to take it from here? Sure. Um, and let me just drop before I forget about it, um, Sean, that while we were limited to 120 people in person, there is uh, a webcast of all the plenary stuff. So if people go to commongoodcyber.org, um, you'll find the YouTube link to the webcast. So you can watch all the plenary stuff on Monday and Tuesday, and there'll even be some opportunities to vote. So coming out of the session, Josh talked about on the morning of the first day, making sure everybody is on the same page, understands the urgency. You know, we're gonna move to uh, a, a set of breakouts and discussion, bringing in some models from other industry and from cybersecurity about what we might do about this. You know, that's sort of like, do we want a Cyber United Way? Do we want a B Core? type approach, some other certification approach. So we'll hear from a bunch of things, what's happened elsewhere and what's been used um, in cybersecurity. Like even, you know, how is how is the cybersecurity support for the Ukraine being handled as a part of this? Um, and then we'll do some voting, we'll do some talking and we'll break for the evening, have a reception, get every chance for everybody to come together. And then on Tuesday, it's about diving into the things that look like they have the most promise. What is the, you know, a lot of pinheady stuff, like what does the governance need to be? But who needs to be involved? What are the strengths and weaknesses? Uh, how do we move forward? What are the next, next action steps? And so we'll bring, we'll have a bunch of breakouts diving into those, and then we'll bring everybody together at the end, hear about that, have a discussion, involve the people in the audience. And then from that, it's, you know, we've done this launch now. We know what the idea is that the community seems to like the most. How do we move forward on implementation? Who wants to be a player? Who wants to be in the, the coalition of the willing um, or one of the thousand points of light? Pick your, your George Bush analogy. Um, Phil, for those who don't know what United Way is, what would a cyber United Way be, you know? What, what's your best elevator pitch for a united way for cyber? Well, there's a couple of different things. You know, one is, do we want a joint fund, right? Like, um, do we want something that people could contribute to, entities could contribute to, and then that could go out to some of the most critical things that need to happen, right? So that could be governments, corporations, um, groups like that, you know, Sometimes there are, you know, it's kind of like with United Way, people say, well, I want to do good, right? But I don't know what good is. So I'll give the money to United Way and I know it'll go to the right places. So should there be some sort of joint fund? The other piece of that is sort of federated giving and joint fundraising, um, which could be a part of that, could be something different. So maybe it's 20 nonprofits go together and they say, you know, we'd like some additional money, U.S. government, or we'd like some additional money, you know, big internet corporation. Um, could you give it to us and we'll 
parcel it out among us, and we can do reports. So there's some efficiencies there. Those are a couple of examples that you might try to work to um, to get more funding to support the most critical parts of the internet. And, and this is an area I hope gets a lot of discussion in the breakouts because when I, you know, took a pause from my career and went into uh, the Atlantic Council, uh, you know, nonpartisan, international, nonprofit. Quite a few people were wondering why we're doing so much work without funding, and like, you know, you should wait. You should get the funding. You know, once once it's funded. And and I think if you think of uh, in the private sector, we have the bell curve of adoption, like the early innovators, right? The the pre chasm, and then the post chasm. You know, late um, the majority. You know, once it crosses the chasm, and then the the lagger minority at the end. Um, I was trying to do things that weren't known to be funded yet, but we we're trying to show, establish a need, show progress, show it was worth funding. And sometimes you can be ahead of the funding cycles. Um, we need that kind of work, but it's really tough to get those things, attention and traction uh, in the current way funding's done. Perhaps if we looked at this as a normal tech startup or a tech company, you know, you want 20% of your R&D on speculative Office of the CTO, mad chemist projects, some of which turn into iPhones, some of which change an in industry. So are we really being thoughtful and planful about where the money goes for either stuff that's speculative and might not work or, you know, stable, but maybe crowded? And then when is it time to say something's a laggard and move money from those things to other areas that have higher levels of need? And I just, uh, I'd like to see more of a unified discussion and unified plan so that we don't orphan critical evergreen projects, but we also don't fail to meet the threat and meet the adversary and meet the urgency just because funding cycles are slow. Um, so I like this notion that instead of every single nonprofit spending a ton of caloric energy redundantly fundraising, is there a way to fundraise more efficiently and put more time on progress? Uh, so many things swirling in my head here. So I, I'll start with this because Josh, you you pointed specifically to people giving their time to take yeah. action. Yeah, and we're talking here about raising money to fund people, fund well, fund initiatives to do some of that work. I, I look at everything like a project. That's just how my brain works. So you have the people and the money, but then there's the ops. Yeah, <laughs> to, to get it to work. And if you're building something, there are you have to define what you're trying to accomplish, how you're going to get from A to B to C to Z, who's responsible for what, what's more important than something else. Um, how are you planning? Because this sounds like about an issue to bring multiple people together to connect, to put a process in place to get the funding, connect the volunteers and, and supplement them with more action and, and other entities, venture, venture capital, government funding, commercial funding, but in the middle is where it all comes together. How, how do you kind of see that being managed? Well, I can start with that yeah. while Josh thinks a little bit more, Sean. I, I, I'd say in some sense, that's a little premature. Um, and what I mean by that is we don't know what the community wants for solutions yet. Uh, I have some ideas on what might work. Josh, as you saw, has some ideas on what might work. Um, but once we know what those are, we can build a plan around that. And so um, I don't want to sort of say this is the way we're going to go forward until we have a chance to hear from everybody. The second thing is we then have to build those work plans with a big tent, right? It can't be you know, somebody big footing, this is how we're going to go, how we're going to do it, everybody's going to come along. If it's going to be a multi-stakeholder initiative, then we've got to have joint governance. Right? And so we have to start with building that community. Um, and I can tell you, you know, let's say we decide we need to joint fund, but there's going to be a bunch of neat things to do. There's going to need to be legal work. There's going to need to be a home. There's going to need to be a governance structure. We're going to figure out how the money comes in. Is it going to be a part of one organization or a new organization? Um, how's the money going to be allocated? What does that governance look like so nobody, so there's no conflict of interest? You know, you can get into a lot of detail pretty easily. And you, I've done that kind of stuff before. Josh has done that kind of stuff before. You've probably done that kind of stuff before. There's a lot of people in the industry who can do that. It's, it's bringing, you know, getting that you know co-creation piece right at the start, and then having the, 
the secretariat support that will drive action. But you know, if we don't have um, really concrete action plans coming together after the initiative and sort of broad buy into them by, say, October, then we're behind. That's the goal. And, uh, you know, such a structure, I mean, I have two divergent answers. One is all these initiatives have the full stack, right? They're doing their fundraising, they're doing their project management, they're writing their papers, they're doing their do tank, you know, field work for whatever their mission scope has right now. We're just redundantly doing those in silos to some level of effect and impact with some level of scarce funding support. Um, so theoretically, you can get some horizontal efficiencies if we combine forces so that people buy a stores action can spend less time on fundraising and logistics, people that are good at logistics can share that not just for one organization, but for more. So there's ways, there's already work being done redundantly and in silos within our individual missions. Um, additionally though, like, I just don't feel like we've had that battlefield strategy that's looking across these initiatives to say, what are the, what's, where has the world changed? What are the gaps? Where are we strong? Where are we redundant? Where do we see current funding? Where's that funding running out? You know, a lot of us benefited from the generosity from the Hewlett Foundation and their fund and Eli Sugarman and his successors and, and whatnot. As that fund sunsets, where's the next sources? You know, we get, we've had a lot of um, support and involvement from say Craig Newmark and others, from corporations, from governments. Um, and the world is getting worse, right? So it, it, it's worth our time to stop, pump the brakes, not stop, but uh, pump the brakes, catch our breath, rise above the fray, and ensure we're doing this. And and what I'm curious to see is based on what focus and scope emerges here, you know, there may need to be parallel other initiatives. So I, I've been more in the hacker community and more in the volunteer community and less funded. Um, but I want to see what the appetite is here so we can do more things better um, and know what the, the remaining gaps might look like. And we can make intelligent decisions in light of that. So I don't even know that this will be one thing that comes out of it. It might be um, several. Okay. So uh, but it's important that we're talking because uh, we got to be better and go faster and uh, start having more impact. Absolutely. And a, a lot of a lot of talking and action is planned for the, the workshop. And I want to touch on the, the community for a moment because just the roster of people speaking mm. is both impressive and extremely well-rounded from what I can glean, just looking at the agenda. Hmm. People from venture to products, to government, to research, to hackers, to, I don't know, I can't go through the whole list. <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of people coming together to present or share their thoughts and ideas as part of the discussion. And then there's the, if you want to call it the audience or the, the non-presenting non participants I presume will be a good mix of that as well. Can you, oh, everybody's got a job. There's no, <laughs> there's no spectators in that room. No spectators. <laughs> just you're, you're either presenting a, your thoughts or, or you're conversing with them in the audience. Um, but so, talk to me a little about a little bit about who all the folks are. Uh, you don't have to go by name of who's speaking on what, but just kind of the idea of how you pulled all those folks together and and what you expect to come from having such a wide variety of folks being part of this. You know, I'd like to say that it, you know, it was super easy, uh, um, but it wasn't, you know, when you try to pull these pieces together. I will say the response has been amazing. You know, our, our notion when we had that meeting at the Canadian Embassy last year is that we'd probably try to get maybe up to 100 people, you know, 50 people who are deeply involved and 50 people who are not. And, you know, the in-person component is up to 120, and we just had to say no more registrants because there's no more space for them. We can't feed them. We don't have chairs for them and stuff like that. So the response has been really big. Um, it's, a, it's a broad collection of people. Um, you know, we've got five different governments attending, um, a number of big companies. You know, Microsoft will be there, Google.org will be there, um, lots of other folks that you would have heard of. Um, a really broad cross-section of the nonprofit community. Um, like I said, you first, like the form of incident response and security teams. Um, uh, we have 
a couple of moderators, so I'm moderating the third day, just to identify two other people. Kirsten Todd um, is moderating the morning of the first day. She started the Cyber Readiness Institute um, and then was the chief of staff at CISA. Um, so she's been in the space for a long time. Megan Stiefel is moderating the afternoon. Megan um, is at the Institute for Security and Technology. Um, she's another nonprofit. Um, uh, we've got someone coming from the Swiss government um, who's going to be talking about data um, and building the business case. Um, Michael Daniel from CTA, the Cyber Threat Alliance, and the former cyber czar for the U.S. himself um, is going to talk about the work done with the Ukraine um, and um, furthering their cyber defensive capabilities. Um, you know, that's it's a it's just a really broad collection. I'd say you know a good chunk of nonprofits, people from foundations, people from companies, people from government, um, and a really diverse collection um, of people too. Uh, so we're we're super excited. One of the panels you saw involves Camille Stewart, um, who's from the Office of the National Cyber Director and um, leads a lot of their partnership and outreach uh, activities. So very pleased with the response and the breadth of people who are coming. And don't worry, we're going to bring the snark. We got you know some of your favorites like <laughs> Wendy Nather and <laughs> yeah, Wendy will be there. Yeah. Um, Craig Newmark, yeah. Ron Gula. Um, you know, on a funders panel. So, uh, um, you know, shout out to Wendy for a second. Um, you know, Wendy really started a lot of this long ago when she started talking about the cybersecurity poverty line. Um, and kind of, you know, what I'd say we've discovered, and Josh was kind of talking about this before, you know, the cybersecurity poverty line, actually because of some of the market failures here, really includes everybody. You know, their market failures for the biggest companies in the world. But we certainly need to pay attention to that. And it's not even an 80-20, right? You know, the cybersecurity poverty line is somewhere around 95% to 99% um, of all entities are sort of um, without help here. If, you know, if, if it weren't, why would there be an all-volunteer organization like I Am the Cavalry that's helping hospitals, mm -hmm. not, you know, not some dry cleaner somewhere, but hospitals do cybersecurity? How does that make sense? I almost said this earlier, I'll say it now, since we're showing some love to Wendy. Wendy and I worked together at the 451 Group when she coined that. And uh, to her credit, it really infected a lot of the things I did during the CISA Code Task Force. So this notion of CISA.gov bad practices, this notion of get your stuff off showdown, this notion of target rich but cyber poor is really trying to take that into the public policy arena. And I think what nobody paid attention to is there's that old Willie Sutton quote, why do you rob banks? Well, that's where the money is. And I think prior to ransomware, attackers and defenders were focused on the Fortune 500. Why? That's where the money is. And, and when I say defenders, I mean everyone selling products at RSA, right? Everybody. Um, when ransomware was an economic innovation, it, it basically realized that the unavailability of anyone can be monetized. So attackers have figured out how to monetize everybody else down the pyramid, the cyber poor. Defenders have not yet figured out how to monetize the cyber poor. So it's an unmitigated feeding frenzy. And this is one of the reasons you see just such unchecked aggression on water, on food, on hospitals, on manufacturing, on oil and gas. Unless and until we figure that out, a lot of our nonprofits started before this ransomware revolution. Unless and until we figure this out, um, we are quite prone on the bulk of the civilian owned and operated critical infrastructure. And this disproportionately hits poor communities, black and brown communities, rural America. We, we have got to figure this out. And that's why I'm so excited that we're pulling together such great minds and such great volunteers. And um, maybe we'll have some enhanced priorities coming out of this. And I was just like, I, I, I recall a post from Wendy in the past few days, I think uh, mm. about the cyber poverty line and it may be connected to this event in fact i don't know i'll have to go look for it. and if i find it i'll i'll link to it and if it's relevant of course i'll put it in the show notes for people to read that yeah wendy wendy's amazing glad she's part of part of uh getting this going as well um i'm super sad i'm not going to be there you can watch 
I can watch. I can watch. I, I should have gotten ahead of the head of the curve on this one. Um, perhaps I'll have a chance to join you in a, at a future uh, future session in person. But regardless, I am going to watch. I would encourage everybody else to watch. More importantly, as you said, Josh, no spectators. All right? <laughs> you got you got to jump in. You've been doing it for a decade now, and uh, and hopefully the rest of us in the community can. And the community is large. We talked about that, right? It's not just the research, not just the vendors, not just people sitting in a in a security seat in the company. It's, it's far and wide reaching. So uh, participate. You can observe as well, but participate is a more important thing. Um, any any final thoughts before we wrap here, Bill and Josh? Just to repeat for folks, you know, go to commongoodcyber.org the you know signing up for further information is possible and the link um, for the webcast it'll be on youtube is available there'll be opportunities to participate we hope during the workshop even if you're not physically in the room um, and the work's going to continue right it's it's an initiative it's not a not a one-off it's not ad hocery so just um, we you know coalition of the willing love everybody to come the cavalry isn't coming. So what are you willing and able to do? And I'm talking to the audience here, right? right. Uh, what are you willing and able to do? Um, we get the world that we uh, deserve. And let's 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 be better. Yep. Everybody should read Josh's handle there, and and not not portray that as Josh is. It's, oh no, it, it's me. red. Read it yourself. I am the cavalry. I'm reading it myself. All right. Uh, Thank you both for the work you're doing here uh, and, and that you've been doing for such a long time. Uh, appreciate it as, as somebody who relies on this stuff <laughs> for, for pretty much everything we, we do in life. And uh, I look forward to seeing you online and uh, hope people enjoy the, the in-person as well. And you're very welcome anytime uh, as you have updates, uh, milestones reached, help needed, uh, the platform here on ITSP Magazine is yours to uh, spread the word and, and to get participants to, to get involved. So thank you both and uh, good luck with the events and we'll see you both very soon. Thanks, Sean. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at Devo.com. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at Imperva.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Cybersecurity with Sean Martin, part of the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share this show and ITSPMagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand with our conversations, you can sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24.